is Dr. Alex Rich. I'm the executive director and chief curator here at the Polk Museum of Art. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce you to our latest exhibition entitled Spirits, Ritual and Ceremonial African and Oceanic Art from the Dr. Allen and Linda Rich Collection. It's also my pleasure to be able to be in conversation with Dr. Allen and Linda Rich here today. Just so you know, Alan goes by Enrico familiarly, so we will refer to him that way. But let's begin talking with them a little bit about how this exhibition came together and how they began to collect all the great works in the show itself. Uh, first of all, hello, Linda and Enrico. Hi. Thanks so much for being here. Our pleasure. So we're sitting in the midst of this great exhibition. We're thrilled to be able to do the showcase of works of art from all over Africa and from Papua New Guinea. And I think it'd be wonderful to learn a little bit about how and by what means you acquired this vast collection. Well, how would you say, how would you begin that, Rico? How would you start that off by well, saying, how did we acquire this collection? We started back in the 60s with the Maasai people of Tanzania and Kenya. And um, then, you know, they don't have a money economy, so you trade everything that you want. In my case, it was trading my clothes <laughs> for some of their <laughs> art true. that we had. We did. And, and actually, that was the way we did things from then on, actually. So, so at first, it was by virtue of being there and then starting to gather objects. But then you yes. started to get some sort of greater affinity for acquiring these objects as you immersed yourselves in yes. the cultures. There were medical projects that we were doing with the Maasai, as well as these other peoples. And it was just while we were there, we acquired some art. Yeah, so let's take a few steps back. Let's think about what brought you first on these expeditions? Well, when we first met <clears throat> at the University of Florida, um, we both had just acquired medical skills. And we decided that what we would like to do, if it was possible, we were gonna work it out so that we could travel and that we could help people along the way. That was our goal as a couple. And so it actually came about where these trips did work out. In fact, 18 some trips. And along the way, um, the collection was really secondary. Um, primary, of course, was Rico's work mm -hmm. and um, uh, providing um, vision to the blind. And so um, a lot of the art has been gifts from grateful patients. And I had an art back always uh, in my youth. And so of course I was drawn to it um, because just because of what it is, I found it very charming. So that's really how the collection began was some were gifts from a tribal mm -hmm. chief, some were gifts from a, from a um, shaman, from a witch doctor and then of course patients, and then what we collected along the way at various markets in various villages. Mm -hmm. and, and I fully believe that's the heart of the exhibition. You can go to many museums and you can find showcases of non-Western art, as we might call it from our Western vantage point. But what made this such a thrilling exhibition, and I think that people are enjoying about it, and what has been so great working with both of you, is that story that you were there primarily for the medical care. Yes. And to think about the grateful patients who were able to have their cancers of the eye, or their cataracts, or their crossed eyes resolved based on your work, and then have the objects here to tell the story as well. I think that's what became so exciting about it. And so we've even tried to include photographs from your yes. four decades of travel here within the exhibition. So it's fun to look back in time through it your is. eyes and through the art objects. And it is for us too. It's really taken us back into our life. And so it's really been quite exciting to, to have it uh, in such a magnificent display. Um, I kid my husband and say, when I go, we go home, I'm gonna have to paint my walls orange <laughs> because the art has never looked so beautiful and well displayed as it does in this exhibit. Yeah, and these are literally in your home. Usually, yes. the first time I saw it, I was there helping with an antiques club talk and looked around your house and literally filled, and this is just, this isn't everything. I this know. is just one subset of the objects you've collected, and obviously they're arranged in different ways, but to see them now in a different light, how does it feel to see it in the realm of a museum exhibition as opposed to around your living room? Well. I'm rather shocked <laughs> because, you know, we saw it every day and it seems so ordinary to us. 
And I didn't think we, the pieces were that terrific because, you know, you see them over and over again. And that's why we were so taken aback when you had the insight to think, maybe we ought to have a non-Western art exhibit starting now. I know that was in the back of your mind to have non-Western art for the museum, which I think is just a terrific idea. And you said, I think this will be the first exhibit, African and Oceanic art. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about what unites these objects. It's not obvious just because works are from the continent of Africa or from Papua New Guinea, which is another halfway around the world, that objects like this should be together in an exhibition. In fact, uh, by a 2014 estimate, there are 1.2 billion people on the continent of Africa. So clearly, different objects from seven different regions of Africa plus Papua New Guinea don't have anything inherently shared by virtue of the people sharing one common culture. But what is it that does seem to unite all of the objects in the collection, in your opinion? Well, I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's that um, each piece is unique to itself. Um, it isn't, it wasn't created art for art's sake. It has a reason and a purpose for existing. And the one thing that ties these cultures that um, Dr. Rich is talking about is that they all are a means in which to summon or call upon certain spirit gods, whether they be ancestors or animals. And so each, uh, every piece of art um, has a design on it that has a meaning. And um, that way they can summon and get the energy or the characteristics of that ancestor, like good leadership or uh, reproduction, um, keeping the family line going, or the animals, um, a good hunter, quick response. They would take on the characteristics of this particular spirit god that this piece of art was created for. And you often talk about this idea of the life force, this continuum, this yes. connection between humans and the spiritual and animal worlds. And we've tried to make that also a through line of the exhibition. And we can look around us in the show, and we're actually seated in front of, I think, some of the most beautiful objects in the exhibition, these chihuahua behind us. Yes. And we've subtitled the show, of course, the show's called Spirits, but we've subtitled the show Ritual and Ceremonial African and Oceanic Art. You know, these works, while we're displaying them in a museum context, they're meant to be performed. They're meant to be worn. And exactly. Linda, you always like to say, the chihuahuas were actually danced. These are the genuine articles, the genuine artifacts that were used by peoples in these cultures. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Uh, well, of course. Um, <clears throat> I was especially drawn to the chihuahuas. In fact, this piece was the very first piece that I ever collected. And um, somehow in my mind, it's an iconic figure from the Bambara people of Mali. And somehow in my mind, I was drawn to it because I think I saw that somewhere many, many years ago on a stamp uh, from Africa. And um, I was charmed by them because it, that's a male and then there's an, a female and her baby. And what this represent, represents is reproduction, but it represents reproduction uh, for abundant crops, for the millet that they grow. Without it, they have no, they have no subsistence. So. Uh, it's very important for them to call upon these agricultural spirit gods uh, with the headdresses. These are worn on the head with like a rattan, rattan basket helmet. And it's a dance that they do that brings about in, uh, communication with those particular spirit gods for an abundant crop. They imitate the antelope. When they dance around, they're actually imitating the antelope itself to try to summon up the chihuahua, the spirit, who's going to help them with their crops. Yeah, and that's true of a lot of objects here. On our, you know, I think a popular part of the show is also the masks that are usually above the entryway in your house. And here, they're all lined up from, all, from Ivory Coast, Nigeria, and from Mali, yeah. correct? <laughs> and so what's been a lot of fun is that everyone's seeing that each mask is unique. Yes. There are certain characteristics that are elemental to different cultures, but each mask, mask itself represents something different, and each person exactly. can find one that he or she, a visitor, might take to in a certain exactly. way. Exactly. Uh, and I just think, and yeah, I, I love learning more about the different cultures through the G 
geometric designs, and the relative abstraction, and it's a different insight through to the purpose of art as well. Uh, do either of you want to speak to how these are both art objects, but also not just art objects? Well. They have no word for it. It's sort of interesting. Uh, none of these cultures have words for art or artist. They, mm -hmm. The concept of an artist is just totally foreign to them. You know, as Linda said, it's not art for art's sake. They're all ritual objects to be used in ceremonies. The talented people who created them were taught how to do so by their father, generally. It's father, son, father, son, uh, sort of thing. And long-standing artworks, I, I've said in some of our tours and our discussions here at the show, is what we think about Western art moving through period after period after period with each artist or each generation defining itself against the one that came before, yeah. this work lasts for centuries and centuries, for centuries the same yeah. style, so it shows you how hardy the tradition is and how yeah. important it is that it is passed down for hundreds upon hundreds of years, yeah. which speaks to a really different purpose. Now, is this beautiful art? Of course. But again, it's not simply for that purpose. It has so many different layers to it. And that's why they don't sign their names like, you know, Western artists would, you know, the creation. That's just their the creation of, a, of an object for um, for ceremony. And they wouldn't think of just signing the name to it. That's right, they don't, yeah. That's right. Um, and so um, the symbols on um, particularly the mask are fascinating because um, after a while, if you know just what a few of the symbols represent, you can identify uh, what, what country it's from and what peoples it's from. And that was the thing that I love learning about the art, uh, the mask in particular, um, was that eventually I got to where I could identify pretty quickly, particularly with the West Af African mask that um, Dr. Rich was referring to. Um, it's, it's really fun, and again, it tells a story, a wonderful story. And I've been so impressed working on this video over the course of two years to put this exhibition together, and then with our team coming in on this and the research for the show, I've been so impressed by your enormous knowledge about these cultures. Obviously, we've expanded upon it, we've all learned so much, even recent months as the show finally came together, but your knowledge really does speak to the way you immersed yourselves in those worlds at the time, and um, I learned so much over the course of this, and I think each object here teaches something new to every visitor. And I would ask, actually, each of you, do you have a favorite object in the collection? Well, Linda's was the Chihuahuas, and my favorite one is from New Guinea. This large piece here, carved out of a single piece of wood, which illustrates how the humans are related to the animals, to the spirits of the animal. You see a, um, a gull connected to the human, which is connected to the crocodile that he's sitting on. They intrinsically know that they're related to the animal world. They're all one of a larger body. Yeah. One of the larger pieces in this. I, I remember walking into your house, and that's really a centerpiece in your living room. It is. Well, it oh, is, yes. Yeah, it is a piece of importance. <laughs> right. Yeah, it looks wonderful here, though. I love it. And I think what's, what's so interesting also about the pieces as, as you move through the show and look at the objects, again, each object is different from every other object, even ones that share similarities, but also the different media being used. We have wood and ivory and ebony and bone and, and lots of fiber wares. Yes. So you can see a great mix of mostly earthen-based objects. And I know one of your favorites is also the lost wax method made bronze. I do, uh, So yes. everybody can learn something new in here. You also can see the varieties of manufacture and how skilled these artisans oh, are. Oh, yes, wonderfully skilled. Um, um, it's, it's just a whole area of art that um, I've always been drawn to. I think I, uh, I'm drawn to the abstraction and particularly the stories, but a lot of times you've heard it maybe referred to as naive art or even outsider art, sometimes Primitive art, yeah. folk art. Mm -hmm. But um, I've always been drawn to that because it's self-taught. There's sort of an innate sense of mm -hmm. principles of design and abstraction. So for me, I think that was probably um, my main attraction 
to this type of art. Yeah, and I think and I think that's an interesting point because sometimes it is referred to as naive or primitive art. But I think if you spend any time among these objects or exactly. among the peoples as you did, you realize that's just a westernized perception Absolutely. of it. There's nothing primitive or naive about it. It's just not the way that art is made necessarily in the United States or in Europe. This is anything but primitive or naive, especially when it's been lasting for centuries and centuries. This is a long-standing tradition, whereas Absolutely. ours could be seen Alternately, Absolutely. on the other flip side of the coin, they could be seen as yeah. primitive or naive because we're brand new to most of the art we make. <laughs> so know. it's a really interesting mm -hmm. idea. And I think as people walk through the show, um, and I think as we've all spent time studying mm -hmm. these objects for a long time, we realize how important, how deeply embedded these are in the cultures of these peoples. They are. They are. And, and the other thing that I like so much about it is that what I've learned since we've been doing this exhibit and since we've met um, Alex Rich is that um, the incredible impact that this art has had on Western art. And yes. um, I was fascinated with the fact of how the mask had such an impact on um, Cubism. And Dr. Rich can speak to that because uh, we even have an insert of a picture of Mo one of Modigliani's uh, women. And evidently, um, from some of the masks from the Ball people of Ivory Coast was his inspiration for doing women with such oval faces and long necks. I found that absolutely fascinating. And the jewelry that I'm wearing today, it's, it's all related to African design. Um, that, I, I, I find that just so intriguing that the impact that this art has had on modern art, Western art, and design. I think a lot of people realize that. I think many people may not have had so much time spent around African or Oceanic art, or as we more generally call it, non-Western art, but they see the way that that has pervaded our Westernized cultures. Uh, yes. Be that in modern art, Picasso picks up mm -hmm. on those trends in 1907, Modigliani around the same time, and takes bits and pieces of the cultures aesthetically, but not think about the cultures deeply themselves, which I like about this exhibition is we are really delving into the cultures themselves. We exactly. can see the influences in graphic design, we can see the abstract design, decor, um, even going all the way. I love when people are coming to the show and they see the headdresses and they think of Black Panther, just the Disney movie in recent years, the oh, Disney really? Marvel movie. So <laughs> there are all those influences that people are picking up on in the show, and they're yeah. seeing how this really does impact their general perception of even our westernized world. <laughs> Yes, and that's what we hope will come out of this exhibit, is that with a new understanding of this art, there will be a, a new appreciation and enjoyment for it when they see it again uh, at other museums or galleries or other private collections. That's, that's our hope from this exhibit. So all we have to think about as the show comes to a close is to get you a bucket of orange paint. We're ready. Go on and on. It's an exhibition forever. You're going to be okay with that. I will be okay with that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you both so much. We appreciate this. Um, the exhibition itself, we go. Well, I was going to say we really need to comment. The one reason I think this exhibit has turned out to be so terrific is because of your fantastic staff that you have working. Absolutely. The way Matt Belcher and Lauren Hicks and, and John Gould. Yep. Yes. Yeah, it's yes. a true team effort from day one all the way through yes. the time of the installation of the exhibition. People's reaction to it is so important to us. It's been a great team effort. So we are, we appreciate yes. that you appreciate that. Oh, Everybody very, very much so. This, and certainly our curatorial team um, has been really excited about this show. It's something that we look forward to doing more like this. Um, and I think it's really oh, yeah. important that we continue showing objects that extend beyond just the Western autumn yes. realm. Wonderful. Yes. We, would, we would like Terrific. that too. Thank you both so much. We appreciate the actual exhibition itself, giving us the privilege of being able to showcase your works here and for spending time chatting with me this afternoon. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so our much. Our total pleasure. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this conversation about our Spirits exhibition and about the African Oceanic Art in the collection of Dr. Rico and Linda Rich. We hope you'll come visit the museum frequently and see more and more exhibitions of this kind into the future. Thanks so much for being with us.